guys, welcome back to the Stuff of Legend. My name is D'Lo, and I also have another Daniel here for you guys. <laughs> Daniel Gall, the master. Uh, the, just call me the voice. I'm gonna make this pencil disappear. <laughs> Ta-da! It's... Ah, it's gone. Oh, and by the way, the suit, it wasn't cheap. You ought to know, you bought it. He's the voice. He is... The Bendu. <laughs> I am the light. I am the dark. I am the Bendu. <laughs> Ezra. <laughs> That's like the best Kanan impression I can do. It's just like the, it's like this like disdain, like kind of like, oh, why do I have to be here? Ezra. That hey, that was good. Hold that on. was some good. That was my first try. Very very good. <laughs> I won. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into this. Today we're going to be bro talking about one of our favorite subjects. As you can tell, it's Star Wars. Um, I don't have my paraphernalia on. It's actually dirty. I just needed to get my, um... I'm sure the fan base will forgive you. The fan base hopefully will forgive me. I need to get either a hat or, you know, one of my things. I was washing, I was doing laundry, and I totally forgot that, um, I was going to need to wear that for this, uh, this video. So forgive me for that. But there is plenty to talk about, and I think plenty to hype about, because Star Wars is not dead. Mm -mm. A lot of people online are hating on, um... All of Star Wars are willing to dump on Star Wars as a whole because of The Last Jedi. And I say uh, nay to all of that. I think that uh, Solo was a blast. I think Solo was a lot of fun, except for I did not like the L3 droid. Um, how do you feel about Solo? Let's just skim well, through Solo real quick. Honestly, I felt it... Uh... I felt it was a bit of a, I, no offense to you and the rest of those who liked it, but I mm -hmm. thought it was a bit of a puff piece movie. I mean, I liked mm -hmm. the, a lot of the legend of the zero they brought into it. The, yep. the respect, my favorite scene was going through the mall. Yes. But I, honestly, I just have to say, I'm kind of disappointed with the solo movie. The, overall? Yeah, overall. I'd yeah. say nothing really original added, just little tidbits here and there, like tributes. Mm -hmm. a lot of, some people felt that way about episode seven, but episode seven was a lot better. Yeah. Well, I will, I will say that, um, yes, there was a ton in there that absolutely didn't have to be. I mean, it feels like they tried to cram the, the dice mm -hmm. down our throats a lot. It felt like there was um, a lot of like nostalgia bits that were, that were thrown in there. That was the whole movie, basically, was in a nutshell. This is a Han Solo nostalgia without Harrison Ford, but they couldn't really help that. Harrison Ford requested to be killed off because he hated the role. Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to hear as huge fans of Han Solo and mm -hmm. the franchise, and when we all... Basically, basically, fan worship the guy, um, but he doesn't want to be part of it anymore. He's sick of the role. He never, he never really liked being a part of it. Mm, even it was, though, yeah, it was there during a bit of his uh, kind of a downward spiral. He's actually got. I don't know if you heard how he tried out for the role. Uh, no, he was actually on set for episode seven. He was uh, for episode four. He was actually doing carpentry work to help compensate to help pay his rent, and uh -huh. he ended up getting auditioned for the part, and he made it. Wow. So yes, it, but it was a bit, I guess that's part of why a Solo was, it was not his favorite role because it wanted, wanted to the role that everyone sticks with him. Like, look at Harrison Ford, Han Solo! Yeah. No! Yeah. That and he also reminds him of a kind of a lower time in his acting career when he wasn't as successful. Right. And it's, it's, it's hard for us to imagine, those of us who aren't like super famous, but if you're getting like blasted by the paparazzi day in and day out, mm -hmm. it's probably pretty tough on yourself, on your family. To just be pursued all the time and just be like, hey, Harrison Ford, can we get a quick pic? What do you think about the new Star Wars or this or that? And he's like, I'm not, I'm not a part of the new, Han I'm not a part of the new Star Wars. You know, and like whatever he's gonna say. Uh, maybe he's rude. Maybe he's crass. Maybe he's, maybe he's maybe, hilarious. Maybe he's just a little jaded. Maybe yeah, he's a little happens. jaded. It happens. But um, nonetheless, uh, I think that, it, it, you know, despite the fact that it was a movie nobody asked for, mm -hmm. despite the fact that it was coming off all the heat and boycott of the Kathleen Kennedy drama from The Last Jedi and Ryan Johnson and all that stuff. A lot of people are very charged right now who have been fans of Star Wars for quite some time, but they have these, they have gripes, and I have gripes with The Last Jedi, but um, that stigma sticks, you know, and a lot of people, I'm, I'm not, I'm not one to uh, boycott per se, but I just, you know, like many of us and you, we have issues with those, with those stories and what they did to some of our favorite characters. Um, it's hard to see that type of stuff, but that kind of makes me excited about the next topic we're going to be talking about, which is not Solo. It's actually the live action Star Wars TV series that will be helmed, written, produced, and I think directed 
Let me just double check that and make sure I'm not like lying to everybody. Well, we're getting this. Uh, we're getting uh, what's the term? Mis misconstrued, misconstrued information. Correct. Oh, it's going to be produced and written by John Favreau. That's right. He's the man who directed Iron Man. He was also heavily influencing uh, the Marvel universe. Um, he's a great writer, great director, but he's also a hilarious actor. He plays Happy in the Iron Man series, he, which he directed and then played in, and also Happy again in Homecoming. Um, and all the other Marvel movies that uh, involved him. Uh, he just, you know, he's a great actor, a funny guy. He also, in Star Wars, has had some history as well. He voiced Pre Vizsla, The Mandalorian. Yes, yes. Which was an incredible story arc. Oh my gosh. That was seriously one of my favorite parts of The Clone Wars, which, by the way, The Clone Wars is my, I think, probably my favorite Star Wars experience due to the sheer amount of quality content that is within The, the Clone Wars. You know, there's the sheer hours <laughs> of Star Wars that you can enjoy inside of the Clone Wars, and it's like under one name. It's like you could you could take all the Star Wars movies, and you still have less runtime than the Clone Wars. You know what I mean? And every every episode has battles in the Force, and it's got relationship building and world building and new planets and character development and character development the heights the lows yeah and getting into like what is the force how do you connect to the force different lightsaber styles different you know like uh not just styles but like how you use the lightsabers the different methods at which you what was it called again the uh the different um uh different types or no the different uh trainings yeah, the different training methods for Jedi versus Sith, or you mean like the different like different forms? That forms, use? that's forms, it. Yes. Forms, yes. Yes, we got form one, the Shishit Show. That's uh, the one that developed at the highest point was uh, Kit Fisto, yeah. the Nautilin. Then we have form two, like uh, Shishit Show is a simple, simple form. Everyone knows it, even like, every Jedi or Sith. They know that, and at least one of the more advanced ones. Who was the Who was the person you just named? Uh, uh, Kit Fisto, the Nautilus, yeah, yeah. like green, green tentacles, black right. eyes. No, well, yeah, yeah. I thought you, I thought you mentioned a second person. Oh, I was going to the second one. That's where we see the, the, the next one's called Makashi Form Two. Mm -hmm. This is the fencer style, the one who developed it, of course, to its furthest extent. Count Dooku. Count Dooku. Yeah, it's meant for blade upon blade, like does lightsaber upon lightsaber, single combat. And because a lot of the Jedi don't use that ever since the Sith disappeared, that gives Dooku and the few who do practice it a great advantage. Right. And that's one of the reasons why he was able to, um, you know, overcome like Anakin with two blades, and uh, in in you know, Attack of the Clones, he had such a drastic advantage because he's not only a master of his art, but that art itself is, like you said, it's it's a rare learn. Mm -hmm. Not a lot of people study it, and fewer even master it. Mm, true that, and true. And then the third form, this is where we see a few different people. I think form three is called. Was it Sarisu? Yes, this is ultimately what will become Obi Wan style. Even though he uses Qui Gon and Yoda's early on, mm -hmm. yeah, he like he uh, along with Luminata Unduli and yeah. and Barris Alfi all use this style. It's basically fast defense. Mm -hmm. About instead of trying to block opponent's attack, you try to redirect it. Mm -hmm. if, if it was if if we crossed Star Wars with the Last Airbender, Obi Wan would have been probably an Airbender because it's right. all about redirection. Yeah. And um, that's it. It's it's fun to get into how detailed Star Wars's lore is, mm -hmm. and how like consistent they have been with the books and with the movies and with the TV series. You know, like there's so much thought that's always gone into it. And uh, you know, like one of the names that's constantly thrown around when talking about Star Wars storytelling quality is Dave Filoni. Oh yes. Um, but word on the sh word on the web is that he is somehow going to be involved with creative ongoing. With Bob Iger being upset or frustrated with Kathleen Kennedy, not because she's not a great producer, she is, but she has she has dropped the ball with the Last Jedi and allowed mm -hmm. agenda, personal agenda, to take yeah. the the forefront over quality storytelling so, within the lore. By polit by agenda, you mean like political correctness? It could be yeah, political correctness, but also like social social movements, social justice, mm -hmm. um, like talking about like. Extreme man-hating feminism. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, you know, so I, where we get like go from like Rose to the Admiral. The Admiral. No man is able to succeed at anything. No endeavors successful unless it was by the rescuing or the overtaking of a woman in charge. Mm -hmm. Not one. Not one. Right. And um, it's it's just it's like it's blatant and it's obvious. Um, but those types of things cause the the fan base, which is majority male. Um, to be quite upset about it, um, not not because we don't have 
you know, we don't want there to be women in Star Wars. There's always been women in Star oh, Wars. You just named four. Yeah, and there's always been very strong women in Star Wars. I mean, look, we got right from the start. We got Princess Leia, we got Mon Mothma, we had... In the Clone Wars, we had Padme and Ahsoka. Yeah. In the season. Ferris Afi. Oh, yeah. I mean, you can talk about good or bad. You've got, you know, Asajj Ventress, who is a fan favorite, oh, one yes. of my favorites personally, the secret uh, apprentice of Count Dooku, mm -hmm. and which he, is savage. Yeah, that's, that's in, the, in the canon, but even in the legends, she's always the most famous of the Dark Acolytes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you get into, um, like, uh, Mother Talzin. Oh, yeah. There's... Who is inc incredible. Uh, character in the story, she's um, you know magic. It's magic, right? Well, it's it's it's, it's, it's a force magic, so to speak. She doesn't have the formal training of a Sith, but she uses another form of dark force. Exactly. Yeah, which is it's crazy to think about how much more there is in the Star Wars canon than just Jedi's and Sith. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just clone troopers and and. Um, and, droids. and droids or Mandalorians, you know, bounty hunters and smugglers. And smugglers, you know, it's there's so much more richness to the to the stories. I'm really excited. I do hope that they continue with a Boba Fett film. I know a lot of people oh, yes. are not wanting that. I've seen a lot of people on the internet not want that or speak out against that. I am not one of them. I really, really, really want a Boba Fett film. He's always been one of my favorite characters, and I I have really want I've imagined a Boba Fett film since my childhood mm. um, your thoughts well it isn't I would, I would say a Boba Fett film would be interesting I just hope they take it in a slightly different direction than the solo right it actually puts a more original footage into it I, yeah I don't want a nostalgia trip with Boba Fett mm. I want I want some crazy bounty hunter or mercenary mission that that maybe goes sideways. Yeah, maybe it's something like uh, have you ever, have you ever, have you ever the, 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 the bounty hunter wars no. Oh, it's part of the Legends series. It's kind of told in two different portions. Mm -hmm. After Boba Fett blasts his way out of the Zarlacc in return, in, during the events of Return of the Jedi, mm -hmm. he's being nursed back to health and then partners up with Dengar. Mm -hmm. And like they're going on this... Cool. Oh, yes. And then and in the flashbacks, Dengar, is tell, Dengar and Boba are remembering this bounty, this, the bounty hunters' wars, is how they went from the huge guild to a few ruthless hunters. Mm -hmm. Basically what happened is the, the guild was really formed like, back hundreds and hundreds of years before the movies. But before the, the better time, the, the bounty hunters formed together a company so that they can actually take advantage of the greater market. Mm -hmm. But the problem is by g g g g making things better for the group, they make things lesser for the individual. Yeah. So the whole thing is run by, the whole guild is run by, ultimately by Kratosk. He's Bosk's father. Ah. Yeah, so then, but. Wow. Mm -hmm. Dude, Bosk is a savage. Oh, yeah. I mean, it would be so cool. I, I mean, depending on what era we're talking about, if we're talking about post Sarlacc Boba Fett mm -hmm. and that's what the film is um, it's going to be a very uh, fundamentally different film than if it's like maybe say uh, episode 3 Boba Fett film or post ep just into the maybe the Rebels early Rebels era Boba Fett or just before yes. that kind of like where the solo film's timeline is uh, under the you know like where there's the, the war of the you know like the Pikes and you have the Huts and you have um, the all channel. the different yeah, the criminal channel. undergrounds kind of at war with each other, that would be a very interesting story to tell. Mm. Setting up um, the Obi-Wan film, perhaps. Mm. You know, like meeting up on Tatooine, there's, you know, Jabba wants to hire somebody or whatever it is. Yeah, it's very, part of like another part of, uh, there was like a junior novelization where Boba, after, right after episode two, and getting, seeing his father getting his head cut off by Windu, yep. he goes on a journey, takes him to Count Dooku, then to Jabba, and he develops into the independent hunter at almost age 13. Mm -hmm. And in the Legends, that's where, it's at that age, like 13, 14, when he and Han Solo first meet yeah. as teenagers. And then from there, they grow tangentially in each other's lives from there all the way through the New Jedi Order. Oh man, it would be so cool. Uh, I, my, my thoughts on this are that, look, everybody loves the Mandalorians. Yes. Everybody loves them. And to tie this into the theme of today... The rumor is that the John Favreau live-action TV series, with a budget of over a hundred million dollars, which is crazy. Oh, that's yes. I think the second highest budgeted film, or maybe the third of all time, um, following like I think the Amazon uh, Lord of the Rings TV series, which is not made yet, and I think maybe like Friends, uh, but that's like if you count the entire series run. You know what I mean? So, like, for a budget that they launched initially, this is massive. Yeah. Um, so, where, 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 where in the, the, did you mention when is when it taking place? Or where? The, new, the new TV series is supposed to take place three years after Return of the Jedi. 
with John Favreau, the live action. So it's going to be um, not animated. It's going to be real. TV series, people playing characters in the Star Wars universe, $100 million budget, three years after Return of the Jedi. The word on the web is that it's going to be on Mandalore. The whole show is supposed to be Mandalore. And uh, this is very exciting because if you saw The Clone Wars, if you saw Rebels, there was so much Mandalorian action in those series. Um, it was basically the second strongest plot next to the actual overarching plot of um, Obi-Wan, Ahsoka, and Anakin uh, just, you know, doing their thing, going from episode two to episode three. True, and even into, even into Star Wars Rebels, we saw a, we saw that with, with Sabine being brought in yeah. with, with the pilot episode, and eventually drawing back to season four, all the way to Mandalore itself, going mm-hmm. up against Clan Saxon. Which was crazy. Oh, yes. It's and so then, exciting. And then we're, hopefully like we see that, like we see after, in the, after, following the Aftermath trilogy, after the Battle of Jakku, and mm-hmm. how Mandalore might be potentially a new, ne- almost like not quite a nexus of the galaxy, but basically a key point of both political and military strategy. That's I'm hoping, I'm hoping they either bring I'm hoping, like maybe they do like a little bit of flashbacks to when Sabine was at the academy. Maybe Boba Fett ran into her somehow. Oh my gosh, there's so much that they could do, and uh, I wish you know I, I want them to just drop more information out. But that's not how Star Wars or Lucasfilm has operated. They're super secretive. But this builds the hype. This gives us a time to just. Uh, express what we want to see, express what we hope we're going to see, what we think we might see, and then get into some theories, dig in. Um, and I, I, I really am not in the slightest worried about um, like Kathleen Kennedy, Ryan Johnson. They're in enough hot water as it is. I'm willing to bet that the, the consultant on production and creative right now is probably Dave Filoni. And yeah, sure, he's probably got his hands full with the new Clone Wars Season 7. Oh, yes. However, finally, one of the reasons why I'm so excited for this, not just because I love the Clone Wars and I can't wait to see more of it, but they also focus on Mandalore. Yes, indeed. When, when uh, I'm sorry, when um, Ahsoka comes back and she's in the hologram, she's like, hey there, Master. You know, and like she does like the whole... Like, you know, it's been a long, it's been a long, thank you. It's been a long time. She's standing there with another Mandalorian. Um, I'm forgetting the name. That's, that's, uh, that was, that was Duchess Satine's sister. Like she was, she was there at the end of the Clone Wars. We also see her come in with rebels during during the resistance to the empire. She ends up wielding the dark saber. I'm trying to think. Well, then go look for that. I'll find it. I'll find it right now. Yeah, so well, Ahsoka's going to be there. She'll somehow be ending up on Mandalore. According to the Ahsoka novel, she's there with the she's, she's there with Rex and and the five hundred first to try and take down Maul because he's still entrenched there. And it's while, during her time there that Order Bo-Katan. sixty six. Bo-Katan. That's Thank right. Katan. Thank you. <laughs> she's the key ally. And, I had to Google that. Sorry, guys. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so she she will be there with Bo-Katan, with Rex and the five hundred first. She gets Maul in a stasis field, and then Order sixty six. Yeah, and that's where she and Rex will escape and eventually disappear. Yeah, and by the way, Rex is a savage. <laughs> yeah. He's the, he's my one of my favorite characters in the entire series. Yes. Um, props to D. Bradley Baker for playing over like four hundred characters oh, in that yes. TV series. Hmm. It's Man, insane. You know, the, 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 so many reflections, the same ads, like being in a fun house. I know, dude. He probably he should get some sort of award. Like you know how they were talking about giving. Um, uh, who's what's the actor who played Professor X in in X Men? I mean, uh, the uh, yes, uh, I remember. I remember. He plays Split. Hmm? There's a movie called I, I Split. About, I talk about old Xavier. No, or young, young Xavier. Oh, young Xavier. Xavier, obviously. Yeah, young young Xavier. Yeah, Patrick Stewart would have been awesome, <laughs> but yeah, well, yeah. he is awesome. Actually, Star, Star Trek movie. France. They're bringing him back. Rumor is, and there's rumor. James that, McAvoy. That's him, McAvoy. Yep. Yeah, he played Split, where he has like I think it was like 13 or 21 personalities. I don't remember which one it is, but. Um, he killed it. He did a great job. But you talk about split personalities. D. Bradley Baker spent what was it, seven years, eight years, or something like that, on the project, and uh, he played every single clone in the Clone Wars. Oh yes. And other additional voices. And so, like, there's probably whole episodes where he's basically talking to himself the entire time. It would be very fun to see him come back. And uh, and for Rex fans everywhere, he got retconned into the Return of the Jedi. He's yeah. there on Endor. Yes, he was. That was so cool. When they were busting in through that blast door on the forest moon of Endor, the guy that has the white beard and the helmet that looks a little bit burly, but, like, not, not chunky or anything. He's just, you know, tough dude looking. Um, 
they made him come back into Rebels looking just like that guy because they knew they were going to retcon him into that guy, the nameless face. Oh, my God. Dude, oh, I'm, I was so happy when they did that. The oh, ending yes. of Rebels, if you guys haven't seen it, is one of the most conclusive but also, like, um, exciting and enjoyable endings you could possibly you could possibly see for a TV series because it closes the stuff that needs to close, but it also gives you enough that they can continue to build. You know what I mean? Oh, and yes. it's, it doesn't feel like a cliffhanger. It just feels like the majority of the story was able to come to a satisfying close. Mm -hmm. And that's a, per that's a masterful ending. Great TV series. If you haven't seen it, you need to check it out. Oh, yes. Check it out and be ready for, an, for a new beginning because that's always how Star Wars is. One story ends, another begins. Absolutely. So, so, stepping, so stepping back from Rebels and... Going back to the Clone Wars, this is the era we'll be focusing on in this bro chat, looking yep. at the prequel trilogy from the Phantom Menace through the Clone Wars all the way to Return Revenge of the Sith. Yeah, and it's um, you know like some some people, if you guys don't like the prequels of Star Wars, um, yeah, my brother, you must have had a sad childhood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, admit, yeah, sir. I was twelve years old when they came out. I had been stoked about Star Wars. When I saw when I saw the first three, and then I saw new Star Wars, I my part of me went, yeah! I know I was, dude. Okay, so I was pretty young when the Phantom Menace came out, like very, very young. I was born in '92, huh. so you were like you were, you were seven. Yeah, I was seven, and so um, all my friends are going to see this, and then I ended up going to see it a couple years later. I didn't see it when it first came out, um, but it was so epic, like getting to see that that you know what got me to want to get into martial arts. Like, I mean, I, I used to watch Power Rangers. I used to watch Jackie Chan and Spider-Man, all kinds of stuff. But when I decided I am going to take martial arts is when I saw Darth Maul do that butterfly kick with a double-bladed double, double -bladed lightsaber. Oh, yeah. I told myself I wanted to learn martial arts right then and there, and that was when I started my journey uh, into, into martial arts yes. from there. And it was my favorite part of, about Darth Maul was the double-bladed lightsaber. I'm saying, yes, twice the saber, twice yeah. the action. Yeah, and then he's just, he's taking on two, two Jedi at the same exact time. This is crazy. Which is interesting, because if you look at the Legends books, Maul was not actually trained as a Sith Lord. He was only a Sith assassin. assassin. Meant to be a tool, but not, a, not an heir. Mm -hmm. And yet, because of, the, because of the inexperience of the Jedi in fighting the Sith, and Maul's just... Well, how do I put it? Gnarly training under mm. Plagueis and Sidious. Oh. We see him just go to town. I mean, it looks yeah. like you think the two Jedi would be the ones pushing the action, but no, Maul is in pulling the strings for the whole fight. Right. And the, what's really cool, what I love, this is a little bit of a on the side type of thing, but if you guys don't follow Ray Park, Ray Park was the stuntman um, and actor who played Darth Maul. He didn't voice him, but he played him. Um, he's an Australian chap, and he. Uh, he still trains to this day, and he goes to Comic Cons all the time. He's super, uh, like you know, communicative and friendly with his fans. But he lives and breathes Star Wars even to this day. He's constantly hanging out with the the, the young actor who played uh, Boba Fett. He's like an uncle to that guy, basically, Aww, not an actual right uncle, there. but he basically took him in. Um, as well as Tamara Morrison um, and um, what's uh, I'm forgetting who the other guy is. Um, Oh, he's not part of Star Wars, but Jason David Frank, the Green Power Ranger, they all, they're all stunt guys, and they did you know all that stuff. And uh, they train together. They put up videos on Instagram all the time. He'll go and he'll whip out his Darth Maul lightsabers, and he's doing his, like... Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So cool know, to like, see. I saw a Comic-Con video where he would... Anyway, the Darth Maul lookalike was trying to do it, and Ray Park comes in, no makeup, and... <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. So cool. Oh, oh yeah. my gosh. It just it makes, it makes my heart sing, dude. Oh, yes. As no. a huge fan, it's, I can't. I can't, dude. It's like... Which I'm, crazy. Still, I'm still wondering if perhaps in the with this ah there was too much to hope for probably they would, they would never do it now but mm. they having call, killed Maul off they would they would to go, to actually go back and I mean, during the uh, summer during the between between episode three and episode four have Maul actually finally fight Darth Vader but I feel, I feel like that, that was you something they really missed out on in Re in Rebels that they, they when Vader you hear that Vader's coming and Maul is there you think well it's natural these two Sith Lords are gonna meet you think. But they didn't do it. No. I would hope, and I will, I will say that maybe we will get something like that uh, in some sort of, like, in some sort of either, mm. um, uh, mo oh, you know what? Maybe they could do that in, in episode, in season seven of The Clone Wars. Yeah, they could. They could do that in season seven of The Clone Wars. Could you imagine getting, getting Vader versus Darth Maul finally? Yes. Oh my gosh. And we know that's not how that's he not passes how either. Mm -mm. So... Somehow, both of them make it out of that fight, but who, who really comes out on top, you know? Who's the one that's really 
the aggressor there and who's on the defense, you know? Mm, true. Maybe maybe it's be like uh, instead of the well, for, instead of the Inquisitors. I mean, they've kind of established some canon with this, but yeah. if Vader could in the early days of the Empire be tasked with hunting down and defeating Maul to prove himself, there's it wouldn't have something to do, or maybe it's, like, it's something that really has to do with the Legends universe. Here, Sakuas. Sakuas. Uh, he's a kind of a minor character introduced through like a through like a like a smaller like bookend kind of book. It's this uh, sort of basically he's, he's one of the agents known as the Emperor's Hand. Okay. Who basically is the same title held by Mara right. Jade Mara, Skywalker. I was gonna say, yeah, the Emperor's Hand was Mara Jade, right? Exactly. Well, actually, there were several hands, fifteen, 15 on, on top of the years, but each one of them had two things in common. One, they were Force users that answered exclusively to the Emperor, and each of them thought they were the only one. Mm. Yes, yeah, so that's where Palpatine. <laughs> in fact, there was a time when actually sounds like a big mistake. Yeah, well, but, but Palpatine never. He was very good at keeping you know, the chess pieces. He can able to keep. He's a master manipulator. Himself. Oh yes, he'd be able to. He, he kept Vader in the dark about the Emperor's hand until he found out. Until he survived the first attack. Mm-hmm. Sakuas. So he actually has two, a double bladed lightsaber. It breaks into two. So he's using uh, kind of a variation style called Jarkai, which is what Anakin used against Dooku in Episode Two. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, Anakin was not fully had not fully trained to that style exclusively or to the extent that people like Asajj Ventress or Ahsoka did. Mm-hmm. So he, that's why part of the reason why Dooku was able to cut one of his lightsabers down. Right. But, um... Well, yes, but Sakuas, he was a he was actually tasked with killing, assassinating Darth Vader to see mm-hmm. if Vader would be able to fully embrace the dark side now that he's in the suit or if he would be just wreckage and easily replaced. Yeah. Oh, man. There's... There is so much... Uh... Great storytelling. So much great storytelling. I want to see. I want to see that type of stuff. That challenge. You know, like the the, the greatest Sith assassin probably ever, Darth Maul, mm-hmm. come and and rise up against Anakin. You know, he's not maybe not Darth Vader yet in season seven, obviously, but he's on the cusp. You know, he's almost there, and all it takes is you know a little bit of hate to stir in. You know, to just he gets a little jaded, and then the, there's the the risk of losing. Padme mm. and losing the yeah, kids. Yeah, true, because he's that's something that Anakin, uh, Star Wars fans, they actually in the episode three book, they, they go through, take a more in depth look at Anakin himself and Obi Wan and other characters. But Obi, but Anakin especially, they call him the hero with no fear in the Clone Wars, and yet fear lives inside him anyway. This is, he describes it as being like a dragon. There's a legend on Tatooine where children, it says. The children on Tatooine tell each other stories about dragons that live in the sun, as being the source of their heat and their light. Smaller cousins of the sun dragons are supposed to live in the... And let me know if I'm rambling too much. Are you okay? Yeah, they, they talk about how smaller cousins of the sun dragons live in the fusion furnaces powered everything from star cruisers to pod racers. Mm-hmm. And I'm quoting directly from the book, Anakin's dragon is another kind, a cold, dead kind, but not mm-hmm. nearly dead enough. Mm-hmm. Basically, it's when early on in his Jedi, Jedi apprenticeship, he and Obi Wan come to a dead system where it's basically it's a star that hasn't turned into a black a black hole, but it's basically on the, just on the cusp. It's like the frigid white dwarf, barely alive, barely mm-hmm. there at all. Mm-hmm. And Anakin thinks stars can die, and the the dragon of the, the dragon of that star is what inhabits him. It's the whisper of fear that says all things die, mm-hmm. and he that lives with him ever since. He's lived with the depths of Qui Gon, mm-hmm. depth of uh, he's seen in the Legends book of Yaddle, the younger member of Yoda's yeah, Yoda, species, yeah. the Council. He also sees his so many of his Jedi friends die. He watches his clone troopers die. He watches his mother die, mm-hmm. and then the vision of Padme. And after losing Ahsoka, that's just the last straw. It's too much pain and too much loss. And that's where and that's what the really, that's that fear of loss and that and that ra- gift of rage that really draws Palpatine to him and how to start to groom him as an apprentice. Mm-hmm. In fact, Palpatine almost thinks that in, when he first meets Anakin after Plagueis' death, he's like, I almost think I see a little bit of myself in this kid. Mm-hmm. And that's what... That's scary. Yeah, and he never knew about Plagueis', Plagueis experiment of trying to create a forceful being and the force striking back, which lies in the book, in the novel, Plagueis is so... so Horrified by Anakin's existence, while Pat, while Palpatine Sidious is drawn in and fascinated by him. I'm so excited by all this. There's so much to be said about you know what they could add in, what we what we might be able to get. Um, but just so I can recap for everybody um, who stuck around this long into the video, thank you so much for watching. But keep in mind for this Star Wars TV series, a few things to note: um, John Favreau is producing and writing. Um, it will be premiering exclusively on, D- on Disney's streaming service. 
So once that launches, whatever that looks like, if it's going to be some branch of Hulu or if it's going to be their own thing, um, it's going to be there. So be looking for that. And then also, um, it will take place three years after Return of the Jedi. Word on the internet is that it's supposedly going to be on or about Mandalore, which is probably the most exciting news to me. Um, and then it's one of three shows in the works right now. So uh, three shows. Apparently, there's an untitled series right now being worked on. Um, and then also there's the Star Wars Resistance animated TV series Dave Filoni will be helming, which is exciting. It's a different style of animation. It's going to take place just before The Force Awakens, like by, I think, maybe five, ten years, something so, like that. So we'll be following like, the, Bloodlines movie, the Bloodlines book? When I don't think so. Also, I, well, maybe. Because yeah. I mean, like, like, the Bloodlines is when... like a, a Pose? Yeah, well, what? Pose mom? Uh, no. Oh. That's when, that's when Leia gets outed as she shows... Like, they, they show like, the recording of Bail Organa and revealing that Vader is, Le is Leia's father mm. as Anakin Skywalker. That's when the, both the core factions and the Rimward factions completely abandoned her and she helps to form the resistance outside the Republic as the First Order continues to rise. Actually, it could involve that. I, that sounds like it would, it would be very cohesive with what we do know about the show. This show, Resistance, is going to focus on the fighter pilots within the Resistance. Yeah. Um, and so uh, there's gonna, they're bringing Oscar Isaac and Gwen, uh, Gwendolyn Christie back so that they, we can have uh, Poe Dameron and um, Captain Phasma will ah. both be reprising their roles mm. into the animated. Yeah, they just can't get rid of Phasma, can they? Just can't do it. I almost wonder, I, I was wondering if the last, with The Last Jedi if she would finally have died. I mean, go, going through the coal on the floor of the starship and going out into the vacuum of space. You figure with her helmet crossed and all that, that would finally be her end. But You would think yeah, so. But backtracking in the timeline, that's a classic way to keep her coming back. It is, but also if you guys want a much more satisfying end for Captain Phasma that adds depth to her character and Finn's, Go check out on YouTube the deleted scene of Finn versus Captain Phasma. Oh, yes. There is an extended edition where there's so much more depth. It makes her seem so ruthless and brutal and worthy of the fear that she was carrying around the, the new Starkiller base and all that stuff. So um, just check that out. And then also, thank you guys so much for watching. You guys, we're going to be talking a lot more, my good buddy Daniel and myself, about Star Wars in the future. If you like what you see here, let us know down in the comments what you like, what you agreed with, what you didn't agree with, what you are excited to see in the future, what you would rather see than what is announced, and then also just engage with us because that's what we want. We want civil discussion and just to uh, geek out about Star Wars with you guys here. Oh, yes. So let us know. Let us know. Thank you. You guys have a great rest of your day or night, and I will see you guys right here on The Stuff of Legend. May the force be with you. Always. <laughs> hey guys, D-Lo here. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, give it a thumbs up. And remember to share this video with all of your nerd friends. I know you got them, and you know who they are. Leave a comment below and let me know what you thought about this discussion. Let me know what you would like to see me do a video on next. Subscribe to the channel because you're a legend, and we have that in common. Also be sure to turn on notifications to be notified right away when I upload my next video or so that you can be alerted when I go live next time. That way you'll never miss a thing. Check out the other videos on the channel so that we can have a discussion on all your favorite movies and TV topics. Thanks again for watching. Stay tuned for more right here on The Stuff of Legend.